Good morning, church. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. So before I uh, present to you our um, PowerPoint presentation this morning, um, I will show first a video, and the video that we are about to see is a uh, visual tour of the uh, tabernacle, right? And uh, we heard about it. We heard about the tabernacle. We read about the tabernacle. And I think we will uh, appreciate more of the tabernacle uh, by having a visual tour of uh, what is inside the tabernacle. And um, I believe that uh, the tabernacle is one of the, uh, the, greatest, the greatest significance of this is, uh, I would say, the structure. Uh, in the history of the Bible, it plays a very significant role, especially uh, leading toward the Christian dispensation and to the uh, scheme of salvation by the Lord. So, um, as I uh, as we present the show the video to you, you can read that in Exodus chapter um, 26, beginning from verses 15 to 37. All right. So, we're going to play the video right now. And for the tabernacle, you shall make the boards of acacia wood standing upright. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half shall be the width of each board. Two tenons shall be in each board for the binding one to another. Thus you shall make for all the boards of the tabernacle. And you shall make the boards for the tabernacle, twenty boards for the south side. You shall make forty sockets of silver under twenty boards two sockets under each of the boards for its two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle, the north side, there shall be twenty boards. And there are forty sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the boards. For the far side of the tabernacle, westward, you shall make six boards. And you shall also make two boards for the two back corners of the tabernacle. They shall be coupled together at the bottom, and they shall be coupled together at the top by one ring. Thus it shall be for both of them. They shall be for the two corners. So there shall be eight boards with their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under each of the boards. And you shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the boards on one side of the tabernacle, five bars for the boards on the other side of the tabernacle and five bars for the boards of the side of the tabernacle for the far side westward. The middle bar shall pass through the midst of the boards from end to end. You shall overlay the boards with gold. Make their rings of gold as holders for the bars and overlay the bars with gold. And you shall raise up the tabernacle according to its pattern which you were shown on the mountain. You shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold, and their hooks shall be gold upon four sockets of silver. and you shall hang the veil from the clasps. Then you shall bring the Ark of the Testimony in there, behind the veil, and the veil shall be divided for you between the holy place and the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat upon the Ark of the Testimony in the most holy. You shall set the table outside the veil, and the lampstand across from the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south and you shall put the table on the north side. You shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle, woven of blue, purple and scarlet thread and fine woven linen, made by a weaver. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia wood. 
and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be gold, and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. All right, so you have now the, uh, you saw the visual uh, presentation or visual tour of the tabernacle. So the lesson we will talk about this morning is about the, uh, the tabernacle. Does it matter to me? So we have here a first picture of, uh, you can see here, You can see here the tabernacle, and then here, this is what they call the uh, tabernacle courtyard. And that also, God gave the specifics for the uh, tabernacle courtyard. And uh, <clears throat> this one is the temple, a, de a depiction of the temple in Jerusalem. So you can see here, this is like the courtyard and inside is the tabernacle. So just like the one that I showed a while ago. Oops. So this one during uh, in the wilderness and <clears throat> this one is uh, when King Solomon finally built a more permanent uh, temple or a tabernacle as they normally call it. Now, in this, uh, in this photo, you will see the inside of Tabernacle, just like what we saw a while ago. And uh, this is the veil okay, that uh, separates the two rooms. The first room that you, would, when you enter, would be the holy place. And the second room would be the holy of holies, or the most holy place place and this particular uh, like square here is the Ark of the Covenant and inside the Ark of the Covenant that is where the the, uh, the Ten Commandments the two table stones and also the rod of Aaron and uh, I, um, the other one is the uh, the manna that was or um, given by God to the Israelites in the wilderness Now, what is the tabernacle? The tabernacle means place of meeting or tent of meeting, since it was the place where God dwelt among his people and met his people. That's why it is called the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle, it is called in different ways. The other names for tabernacle is the tabernacle of the congregation. You could read that in Exodus chapter 27, verse 21, under the, the uh, King James Version. And in the ESV, English Standard Version, the name Tent of Meeting is used. In New King James Version, the Tabernacle of Meeting is used. <clears throat> and also, according to Acts 7, uh, 44, in the ESV, Tent of Witness is used. In the Berean Study Bible, the Tabernacle of Testimony is used. And in King James Version, the Tabernacle of Witness is used. So there are uh, those are the other names that was inter interchangeably used for the word tabernacle. Now, the temples, okay, the temples met the needs of the people by providing them with a sacred space to commune with the divine, according to worldhistory.org. So that's what basically the meaning and the purpose of the temple. Now, therefore, it is a holy place where the presence of God meets humanity. It is a physical structure for God's dwelling place on earth. It is also called the house of God, according to 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 14, so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house or the temple of God. Now, the tabernacle in the wilderness, it was a portable um, place of worship that God commanded the Israelites to build after he rescued them from the slavery in Egypt. So wherever they go, they could bring the tabernacle with them and they could uh, dismantle it and then 
um, plays it again. Now, it was used from a year after they crossed the Red Sea until King Solomon built the first temple in Jerusalem, a period of 400 years. It houses the Ark of the Covenant, according to LearnReligious.com. Now, some of the, uh, there are some important things I want to point out um, regarding the tabernacle courtyard and the temple built by King Solomon. Now, just want to remind everybody that those uh, the courtyard and the tabernacle, um, God strictly instructed how um, it should be built. Now, the tabernacle was designed explicitly by God. And as you could, uh, you could read that in Exodus chapter um, 26. Now, the only difference between the, this tabernacle, between the two, the tabernacle and the temple, again, the tabernacle was made to be mobile while the temple that was built by King Solomon was only a, a permanent. Okay, so that's basically the, the, the big difference between the two. Now, inside the tabernacle is a place called the Holy Place and the Holy of Holies, which was divided by a thick veil. All right? Now, the outer, uh, the outer sanctuary again, a holy place and the inner sanctuary where the Ark of the Covenant is, is called the Holy of Holies. Now, the first lesson that I want to share with all of us today is the tabernacle among us. The physical structure of the tabernacle, including all the major components that is inside the tabernacle, it was just a foreshadowing, I would say foreshadowing of the perfect tabernacle in Jesus Christ. Now, the tabernacle served as God's presence with his people. So that's why wherever they go, they would be in the tabernacle with them. Now, when Jesus came, the people did not need the tabernacle anymore. Okay? Where Jesus would be forever with his people, that's why he was called Emmanuel, God with us. According to Matthew chapter 1, 22 to 23, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And in John chapter 1, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So there's no need anymore for the tabernacle or to bring the the whole courtyard of tabernacle right of this dispensation because Christ dwelt among us and uh, like his name was called Emmanuel because God is within us. Now, the altar of incense, the mediator, Jesus Christ. I want to show to you a, a picture of what the altar of incense, um, in, incense sorry, looked like. And again, if you would read Exodus chapter 26, you could see the, uh, the command of God, how the uh, altar of incense was to be made. And in the tent of tabernacle, you can see the altar of incense right here, just before the veil prior to entering the most holy place or the holy of holies. So this is where the altar of incense was located. Right. So um, the incense often represents prayer. Okay. In Psalm chapter 141, verse 2, it says, my, May my prayer be set before you like incense. So it is the prayer of David. So when we talk of incense, it has something to do with prayer. And when the priest Zechariah offered an incense in Luke chapter 1, and the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. So when it was time for the burning of incense, um, there was a multitude before Zechariah would lit the incense, there was a multitude of people waiting for the incense to be lit up 
so that they could pray. Okay? Now, for the uh, 40 years <clears throat> that the Israelites were in the wilderness, this, this reminds us of the important role of prayer. Okay? Prayer in the life of a Christian uh, or a servant of the Lord. And during that 40 years, the incense reminds them of the importance of prayer in their lives. So the incense is uh, represents uh, prayer. Now, just like the incense in the Old Testament that continuously burns, it's a continuous act because it was a sweet aroma to God. Now, it was a sweet aroma to God because God would hear their prayer. And the incense would be uh, lighted up twice a day, morning and evening. So there was a continuous a smoke coming out from the tabernacle. Now, that's why um, in the life of a Christian, we are told by Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, that pray without ceasing. So somehow alluding to the burning of incense inside the tabernacle morning and evening. It's a continuous uh, sweet aroma to God hearing the prayers of the people. So prayer is paramount to all of us. It should be part of our daily habit. Not only, uh, not only that we should pray when we are to receive um, blessings from the Lord when we are in front of our food, but it should be a day-to-day -day, uh, habit of ours to talk to God. Again, that's why Paul said, uh, pray without ceasing. Now, in the Christian dispensation, we will now see the importance of Jesus okay, um, in prayer. We don't need any priest, for that matter, to intercede for us. Because during the time, a priest would enter the, the holy place and he would lit up the incense so that uh, the prayers could be heard by the Lord. In the Christian dispensation that we are in right now, we don't need any priest to intercede for us so that we could uh, pray to God. We could directly now pray to God because of Jesus. And uh, when we pray to God, it must be in the name of Jesus, the mediator between us and God. Now, as the priests in the Old Testament okay, were used by God so prayers could ascend to him, in our age, Jesus is now our high priest. In Hebrews chapter uh, 4, verse 14, it says that Jesus now is our high priest. So as such, being Jesus our high priest, Jesus became our intercessor. He mediates. He intercedes okay, and, uh, um, between us and the Father. So we don't need any, any more priests for that matter, just like what they did in the Old Testament. In Romans chapter 8, verse 34, Who then is the one who condemns? None, uh, no one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So finally, when Jesus died and when Jesus came and he died, he became that high priest for all of us to intercede between us and God. And we don't need anymore again any priest to intercede before, uh, before us and we don't need them uh, for us to Pray directly to God. With Jesus Christ coming here, we can now talk, we can now pray directly to God because of Jesus Christ. Now, the following verses are a proof that we are to pray in God in Jesus' name because Jesus intercedes. Jesus is the mediator. In John chapter 14, verse 13, And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. In uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, giving thanks 
always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So all the things that we need to say to God, all the things that uh, we need to plea, we ask uh, for God should be done under the name of Jesus Christ because again, he is our mediator. He intercedes for us. So that is the importance between the lighting of the incense in the, uh, the tabernacle and the prayer that we are doing right now uh, to the Father. The atonement, the mercy seat, and the ark of the covenant. This is a, a picture of what the ark of the covenant looks like. So again, inside there's the, uh, uh, the, the the stone of the Ten Commandments, and the mercy seat is actually the lid, the covering, the top covering, the top covering of the uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. That is what is called the mercy seat. Now, again, what is inside the Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod and uh, the golden pot of the uh, uh, manna. So here, this is where the location of the Ark of the Covenant. It is inside the most holy place or the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies once every, once a year. Okay. Now, so, once a year, during the atonement, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies in this particular day, which they call the Day uh, of Atonement. Now, atonement, it means covering. It covers. It was to repair the broken relationship between man and, and God by covering the sins of the people. So, the, the high priest would first make a sin offering for himself and for the other priest by killing a bull. Now, the blood of the bull would be uh, sprinkled on top of the mercy seat, the lid cover of the Ark of the Covenant, and towards the Ark of the Covenant. Now, this sprinkling of the blood of the bull, it cleansed the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant and the holy place or the, yeah, the holy place. In uh, Leviticus chapter 16, let me just go through with this. Um, in Leviticus chapter 16, verses 11 to 14, this is how the atonement uh, was made by the high priest. When Aaron presents the bull for his sin offering and makes atonement for himself and his household, Aaron was the high priest, he is to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. Then he must take a censer full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and take them inside the veil. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord and the cloud of incense will cover the mercy seat above the testimony so that he will not die. So this is important. The lighting of the, the incense is important because it will somehow block the vision of Aaron before he would enter the Holy of Holies. Because in the Holy of Holies, that's where the presence of God is. And remember, um, when, uh, when Moses wanted to see the Lord, the Lord said, nobody can see me and live. So he only showed his back. So that is where uh, the essence of the, the, the smoke so that it can blur the vision of Aaron or any high priest that would enter the Holy of Holies so that they could not see God. Because that's where the presence of God is. Now in verse 14, so it says there in verse 13, so that he will not die. Now in verse 14, and he is to take some of the bull's blood and sprinkle it with his finger on the east side of the mercy seat. Then he shall sprinkle some of it with his finger seven times before the mercy seat. So uh, this particular um, verses tells us how the high priest would offer 
a sin offering for himself and for the other priest. Now, the next procedure would be for the atonement of the sin of the entire nation of the Israelites. So then they will then, uh, the high priest would uh, kill again, uh, this time goat as a sin offering for the people. Then the blood would be sprinkled again uh, on the mercy seat. It is like repeating the first process, uh, the procedure over again. And we can read that in, uh, as we continue reading Leviticus chapter 16, so we go to verse 15. Aaron shall then slaughter the goat, uh, slaughter the goat for the sin offering, this time for the people, and bring its blood behind the veil. And with its blood he must do as he did with the bull's blood. He is to sprinkle it against the mercy seat and in front of it. So he shall make atonement for the most holy place because of the impurities and rebellious acts of the Israelites in regard to all their sins. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting which abides among them because he is surrounded by their impurities. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make, uh, in to make atonement in the most holy place until he leaves. After he has made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole assembly of Israel. So the atonement process um, in the tabernacle gave us again a glimpse of what was to come in Jesus Christ. Now the high priest, the high priest would enter and uh, after the, the uh, enter the, the, the Holy of Holies every year and sacrifice blood every year, okay, year after year, that would only cover the sins of the people. It will only cover their sins. Now, but Jesus, Jesus came and did more than that. Jesus came and did more than covering. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. That is why uh, the high priest would, would kill uh, an animal and sprinkle the blood in the mercy seat so that uh, it would only cover, but again, according to the book of Hebrews, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away the sins. Now in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, part of the scripture reading, with his own blood pertaining to the blood of Jesus, not the blood of goats and calves. He entered, Jesus entered the most holy place once, once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Amen to that. Jesus entered the holy of holies once for all time and offered his blood so that we, our sins can be finally be forgiven because uh, the blood of the bulls and goats could never take away our sins. Even year after year that the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies, sacrifice year after year, uh, bulls and goats, those sacrifices could never take away our sins. But only the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ could take away our sins. And he did that for all time, once for all time, and secured our redemption forever. And Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world. Now remember, during in the Old Testament, the sacrificing of the, the goats and the bulls were only for the sins of the Israelites, not the entire world. But for Jesus Christ, it's not only, and it is not only exclusive for the Israelites, but it is for everybody. That includes you and I. And how cool was that? Amen to that. Amen. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, for Christ also suffered, I'm oh, sorry, 1 Peter 3.18, let me read to you. For Christ also suffered once for sins, 
the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Now we go to the temple veil. We go to the veil. Okay? The veil that was torn. So the veil is right here that separates the holy place to the holy of holies, to the most holy place. So this is the veil. And it is so thick. Even if the, uh, accidentally, if the priest from the, uh, the holy place would trip, he will not go inside the holy of holies because of how thick that veil was. So uh, the heavy veil that hung from the ceiling to the floor, it separates the holy place from that of the holy of holies. And it is a picture, a picture of how sin separates us from God, from the holiness of God for that matter. Now the thick veil creates a barrier between the people and the presence of God. In Isaiah 59 verse 2, but your iniquities have built barriers between you and your God. So the veil in the, uh, in the tabernacle somehow represents the separation between the sinful nature of man and the holiness of God. But your iniquities have built barriers between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Now, when Jesus died on the cross, to pay the ultimate penalty for our sins, offering and giving his life. Now notice that the curtain in the temple uh, was torn. <clears throat> okay, it split in two. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 41, uh, 51, then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two form, or in two, from top to bottom. And the earthquake and the rocks were split. Now the question is, what is the significance of the torn veil? Now I would like to uh, put some of the reasons uh, or the significance of the torn uh, veil. Number one, it means that Jesus is the only way to the Father. Now the veil that was torn represents the removal of the high priest. So we don't need the high priest anymore. Functioning of entering the Holy of Holies every year to intercede and to sacrifice uh, for the sins of the people because Jesus, when he came and he died, Jesus became the superior high priest. Again, if you would read Hebrews chapter uh, 8, 9, and 10, you would see Jesus Christ being the high priest. So Jesus is and became the superior high priest that can only lead us to the Father. So that's why uh, the, torn, uh, the, the veil was torn or was split because Jesus is the only way to the Father. The next importance of it is that we now have access to God through Jesus Christ. Now when the veil was torn, it gives us a direct access to God. Again, doing away with the, with the priestly functions that they would uh, lit up the incense and they would pray for us and they would offer sacrifices for us. When the veil was torn, it gives us access to God through Jesus Christ. The third one, it reconciles us with God. Reconciliation with God. Now, the veil, again, that once separates us from the holy presence of God because of sins, now God took it down. He took it down. It was split, was torn. Okay? Through uh, when Jesus Christ suffered and died on the cross, the Lord took it down so that we could be reconciled to God. It is reconciliation of God, uh, man to God. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, And by him, 
to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Now remember, when Jesus Christ died on that cross, when his blood spilled on that cross, the veil in the temple that was so thick, even the strongest person cannot tear uh, any part of that veil because it was so thick. Now, during the time when Jesus Christ died, that 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 veil was torn, it was split, meaning that God reconciled us to Himself through the blood of Jesus on that fateful day, when His uh, when His blood dripped and flowed at Mount Golgotha. Now, the next is it brings salvation. For all. The significance of the torn veil is salvation for everybody. Again, as I've said a while ago, during the time only the nation of Israel had access to God because of the tabernacle, and they were the chosen uh, nation by the Lord. Now, again, the tabernacle it represents the presence of the Almighty God. Now, when the veil was torn up uh, upon the death of Jesus Christ access not only to God but access to salvation was open for all it was open for all it tore down the barriers of exclusivity that salvation was only for the Israelites every one of us we now have that access to God and that access to salvation now Jesus Christ upon his death he removed that exclusivity that only belongs to the nation of God, the Israelites. Now, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it might remind us all, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is what? The power of God unto salvation. To whom? Both the Jews and the Greeks. So there is no more ethnicity. There is no more ethnicity, regardless of who you are or your status in life. Jesus brings salvation to all who want to be saved. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 29, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, here's the good news there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female. And guess what? For you are all what? One in Christ Jesus. Amen to that. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. And then what? Heirs according to the promise. Amen. So that exclusivity that only belongs to the Israelites, God removed that. Jesus Christ uh, when, when Jesus Christ came and poured out his blood, that veil was torn to remove that exclusivity, and now it includes all of us. The tabernacle, my dear brethren and friends, played an important role. It played an important role in the history of the Bible, leading to Christ and our salvation. Now we can see how this tabernacle, this beautiful sanctuary that was built by God connect itself to, to God's plan of salvation. So from the Old Testament, we can see that this tabernacle has something to do with the scheme of redemption that God from day one already planned in his mind. Now we can see the role of tabernacle to the coming of Jesus Christ. We can see the role of the tabernacle in our lives as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, the tabernacle as a foreshadow of the redemptive plan of God to save us from our sins, not with animal blood, but with the precious blood of his only begotten son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I would leave you with these final verses from the Bible. 
Hebrews chapter 9, 14, 15. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, purify our, cons our consciences from works of death so that we may serve the living God. Therefore, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died to redeem them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. The tabernacle is just a foreshadow of that plan of the Lord from the very beginning to save us. Now my dear brethren and friends, it is my humble appeal, especially to those who have not yet accepted the Lord, our Savior Jesus Christ. We want you to let the blood of Jesus cleanse you of your sins. Let Jesus Christ dwell in your heart and be forgiven of your sins. Christ became, remember, your mediator of a new covenant so that you may receive the promise of eternal inheritance in heaven. The gospel is yours. I hope you can see the importance of the tabernacle. I hope every one of us has a better, a better view and understanding of the tabernacle. And Lord willing, we will have a part two, Lord willing, next Sunday with regards to the tabernacle and the temple. Again, the gospel is yours. But whatever you are uh, going through in life, continue to live in Jesus Christ. Make the choice to come forward, repent of your sins, and be baptized and start a wonderful journey with God. Good morning, and God bless us all. Shall we all stand up as we sing the song of invitation? <laughs>